to the Plugged In Podcast, a new project from the Institute for Energy Research. To find out more about our work, visit our website at instituteforenergyresearch.org. Welcome to the Plugged In Podcast. I'm Jordan McGillis. And I'm Alex Stevens. Today we're joined by Don Watkins of the Center for Industrial Progress to discuss entrepreneurship and the culture of the energy industry. Don joined the Center for Industrial Progress last year after a decade-long stint at the Ayn Rand Institute. He's the author of Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality, and he's also the author of the national bestseller, Free Market Revolution, How Ayn Rand's Ideas Can End Big Government. Don, thanks for coming on the show with us today. Yeah, happy to be here. Let's kick things off with uh, you informing our listeners about the mission of your organization, CIP, and uh, what your guiding principles are. Sure. I, w- I would say what what's unique about the Center for Industrial Progress is that our primary concern is how we think about energy and environmental issues. So obviously it's important what conclusions we draw about the best forms of energy or energy policy, but what's vital to be able to reach the right decisions is that we think about them in the best way possible. And so my background and Alex's background, Alex Epstein is the, the founder for, of CIP, um, is in philosophy, which is all concerned with how do we think clearly and make the right decisions. And one of the things that Alex noticed when he got interested in energy, and I think one of the reasons he became very interested in energy, is because the whole way that people were thinking about energy and and communicating about energy was just a nightmare. And there's three major elements that he noticed and I think are really pronounced in the discussion today. And so one is that the conversation is extremely biased, that we only hear positives, for instance, about solar and wind, and we only hear negatives about fossil fuels. And if we're only if we're looking at our alternatives in a biased way, we're never going to be able to make the right decision. And then the other thing that he notices that it was extremely sloppy. So if you take like the climate debate, and it's it's usually framed as is climate change real? But that's a very imprecise question, right? Because it makes a big difference. Is it going to be runaway and catastrophic or is there going to be warming that is mild and manageable? And then the question is, well, why is the bias and sloppiness always directed against fossil fuels and against industry and directed in favor of things like solar and wind? And the the basic reason we think is that the whole goal that frames our energy discussion is anti-human so like if you think um we're often taught like the goal is to be greener the goal is to minimize our impact on nature but the way that human beings have survived is by transforming nature so if we went back to when when did we have like far less impact than today 300 500 years ago people lived lives that were nasty brutish and short and it was only by transforming nature on a major scale that we've been able to live till 80 with incredible prosperity, with incredible health. And that's all made possible by this transformation that if our goal is to minimize our impact, we're not supposed to engage it. Like we shouldn't have turned New York into New York. It would have been better off from the perspective of being green that we just left it as an untouched uh, wilderness. And so if you take seriously this idea of minimal impact, then you're going to be thinking about things in an anti-human way. And and so what we believe is that our goal shouldn't be to minimize our impact, but it should be to maximize human flourishing, which means make life as good as possible for the most people as possible. And that that involves having an impact. It involves, you know, having a footprint. And then what you want to do is you want to maximize the good impacts and minimize any negative impacts. And so ultimately it's that we're for being pro-development, but anti-pollution versus the green movement, which we think is just anti-development, which means it's anti-human flourishing. From our perspective here at IER, we see the green movement, or if you want to call it the, the nature for nature's sake movement, as having a lot of cultural influence. And yet, at the same time, there's this widespread understanding in the culture that oil companies are big and powerful. Uh, why do you think that is? And, and do you think there's some accuracy to that? Is it inaccurate? Well, people do think that they're big and powerful. I mean, I think this is part of there's also an anti anti business bias in the culture. And so we think that business 
has all of this power that they've amassed illicitly and use illicitly and that what we want is some ideal that's sort of anti-business and anti-development. So one part of that is the green movement, but then there's just the larger egalitarian movement, which wants to minimize success of any sort. And the and so what I think you see is there's sort of a tension that is elite opinion, I think, is very much dominated by green thinking. Um, and then the but I think most people recognize in some form that like they want to have a good life. They want to be healthy. They want their kids to be prosperous and successful. And so there's this tension between our feeling that, well, the moral ideal is being green, um, but practically no, we need the energy provided by fossil fuel companies. And the the what the way that that generally works out then is that we tend to move step by step towards more restrictive policies on fossil fuels in the name of being green. And it's only slowed down by this kind of incohate feeling of, yeah, that's not the direction that we should go or that's going to harm my job or that's going to harm my pocketbook. And it's slowed down by the deep pockets of the industry. But the direction doesn't change. That is, we don't see a movement towards increasing freedom for energy producers. And that can only happen if you challenge and change the ideal and change it at an explicit level. Because even people who have this sense that, yeah, I want energy and I want success and I want uh, prosperity, they accept a lot of this anti-human thinking themselves. And even many intellectuals who are pro-industry and many uh, policy analysts, they'll embrace certain elements of green thinking, such as like if you look at the industry's own arguments, they really amount to the idea of, well, look, we, we sh yes, we need to be renewable, we need to be green, but look, wind and solar just aren't there yet. And so their argument basically amounts to not we're a positive good, but we're a temporary necessary evil. And then what the more consistent greens do is say, yeah, we, you're not that necessary. And, and that really becomes then the debate is what's the timeline for the extinction of the uh, fossil fuel industry? And How much of that do you think is illiteracy regarding the capabilities of various energy sources? Well, there's there there is an illiteracy, but you have to ask, like, well, why would that illiteracy be so widespread and why would it work in one direction? And so. This comes back to if you're thinking about it in an anti-human way, if you think like, look, the ideal is green energy, then you're going to be very much encouraged to buy into the idea that it's it, it's possible and that fossil fuels are replaceable. Who are you talking to? Are you talking to policymakers or people within the industry? Well, we're talking to both. And then it's just an issue of like, what's the focus? So when we're talking to industry a lot of it is about how can you be more persuasive in arguing for the virtue of your industry and then policies that liberate your industry so that you can continue to aid human flourishing. And then when we're talking to the public, there it's not how you persuade people uh, that the industry is good, but it's persuading them that the industry is good and that we need policies that protect the industry and more widely – you know, our goal is not fundamentally to defend the fossil fuel industry or even fossil fuels. It's to convince people that the way we should be thinking about that question is from a pro-human way that is very even-handed and precise rather than the anti-human way that's very biased and sloppy. And by empowering them with that sort of framework, they will be able to make better decisions that will allow them to enhance their lives. What do you think about Elon Musk? I mean, he's he's interesting and I think he's mixed. I think that, uh, like obviously he's very creative and ambitious and in another sense, he's not that ambitious. So Alex had this line once where Elon Musk thinks we can make Mars inhabitable, but that we can't make the earth inhabitable if the temperature goes up by two degrees. <laughs> and like, there's a real sense in which he's I think, hampered by this anti-human thinking so that his ambition gets directed in ways that I don't think actually enhance human well-being as well as they could. How about your thoughts on the motivations you see when you are out there talking with people within industry? Are Is there a purely bottom line motivated interest? Are there people who are creative in their thinking? Uh, I'm sure there's a, there's a mix of both. And, and, that those, and again, those things aren't uh, unrelated, of course. Um, but what are what are you seeing regarding the culture 
in business today? So there, there's a way in which I think it is sort of bottom line focus, but not in a nefarious way that they don't care about, you know, human well-being. They have a sense that their industry does something positive, but they're uncomfortable in that territory. I mean, most of them are engineers. And a lot of the reason people tend to go into things like engineering and science often is because they recognize that there's no rigor in the humanities and they want to be rigorous and logical. And I think I think that's part of what's going on. And then it's the, you know, look, they're not intellectual innovators. They spend their days thinking about how to produce produce the energy that human beings need to 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 flourish. And the only philosophy for thinking about environmental issues has been the green movement's uh, way of thinking about them. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is empower them. So it's like you can think about what you do in moral terms with the same rigor that you do about your business and about the production of oil and gas, let's say. And, and I think they find that very empowering and it gives them a deeper appreciation for their work. And then I think it will ultimately enhance their ability to fight for better policies. Do you see any particular strategy for uh, encouraging companies to avoid the temptations of regulatory capture? Um, I'm thinking about Amazon in particular. This is a massively successful, incredibly life-enhancing company that has some unsavory uh, relationships with local and, and federal governments. Most recently, they decided that they would uh, increase their internal minimum wage and then announced they'd also encourage policy to match that. Any thoughts on that sort of thing? Well, so one thing you have to to like we have to keep in mind that we live in a uh, country that's you know what's it's a mixed economy. It's not free market capitalism where people can independently engage in productive activities so long as they're respecting the rights of others. It's you need to all sorts of permissions. You can have all sorts of controls placed on you. You are enmeshed with government from day one just by virtue of the fact that you want to do something productive. And so one of the things that happens in a mixed economy is part of the time it's, well, I don't want interference with what I'm doing. And so I have to, you know, play certain political games or I want to get something done and I have to jump through certain political hoops. Um, but there's potential for people acting uh, under the rubric of business to actively use the power of the state in order to give them special favors or to harm their competitors. And I mean, this will often be put as cronyism. And what I think one of the things that happens is that the line between those two things can often be very blurry. And even a person who's really conscious of this issue and trying to do the right thing, it's not always clear what to do. And I think most businessmen aren't really fully conscious of, uh, of this issue. Now, if you take a company like Amazon, I think the starting context, first of all, has to be that like this is one of the most productive companies in history. I mean, certainly just reflecting on what they've done for my life. My life is so much better now that I can get virtually anything I want quickly and at a at a low price. Like they've really transformed the world in a positive way. And so like that always has to be the starting context. And they they did it by creating values, not by getting special favors from government. Like that is not the primary at all. And then so if you look at all right, well now this minimum wage thing, like I'm I'm opposed to the minimum wage. I think that it prevents people it makes it illegal for you to work if you can't find somebody to hire you at $15 an hour let's say so it's a it's a real injustice but i mean amazon has been hounded by attackers who say that the important thing about them is not the positive that they've achieved in the world it's that they don't pay their workers as much as we who created nothing who created no jobs think they should it's and and they've been just attacked and harangued for that for for years. And so under that scenario, the primary injustice here is what's been done to Amazon. And the and the fact that they've done something where now they're saying, yeah, we're, we think that there should be a national $15 an hour minimum wage. I think that's bad. Um, but it's just if you're if you're measuring up the injustices, 
Like that's just on such a small scale relative to their virtue and to the injustices committed against them. So would your argument be then that instead of focusing on these decisions that some business leaders are making, um, instead we should focus on the rules in which they're trying to operate their business under and focus our, our criticism more on that um, without, without, of course, excusing the companies that, that truly have uh, that cronyist mindset, of course. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's just like, you know, if if your teenage daughter litters, but she's also a heroin junkie, like you're going to focus on the one that's like a, a bigger problem. And if you have a company like Amazon that's promoting an idea that's very widespread in the culture already of $15 an hour minimum wage, but you have a system where businessmen are not free to actually operate just by productive achievement, they have to be enmeshed in politics and they're forced you know, they're threatened every day with this regulation or control and, you know, are fighting for their lives politically. Uh, in that sort of context, I think the primary has to be on the government policies that created that situation. And, you know, you can point out like, no, Amazon, y you can do better. Um, but like, you should always have a sense of proportion about like, what really is the fight here? I think it's, it, it's very, if you equalize your outrage about everything, um, then, you know, it's the boy who cried wolf syndrome. What are your thoughts, Don, on the narrative in the culture that there's a bifurcation of our society between coastal, quote unquote, elites, tech workers, um, the creative class, and people in the middle of the country who grow things, build things, and dig things up out of the ground? Well, I wouldn't put the narrative, I mean, that that is the narrative, I think there's there's definitely a truth that there are, uh, if you want to put it as kind of two different cultures, um, and I think both sides have positives and they have negatives. I think you know presenting one is like, oh, we're the paragons of virtue and of science and of uh, you know tolerance and all these things, and the others are kind of country bumpkins who are Bible thumping yokels. Like, yeah, like that, I think is wrong. Nor do I think it's right that you have these clueless elites who are the ones, you know, with their heads in the clouds and want to control everybody's life. And then we have these virtuous people who just, you know, are um, trying to do the right thing and believe in American values. I think that basically there's positives in all parts of the culture and there's real negatives. And so then there's a question of, well, is the division itself problematic and dangerous, which I think there probably is. I think you don't want that sort of a division in that sort of way. But then the question is more like, all right, well, what are we going to do about it? Like, what's the solution to this? And I think what you can do is have just a better agenda that for everybody, it's you don't take sides in that kind of tribal war. You rise above it and say, like, look, I have an agenda for individuals that are enhance their ability to flourish and then help define the kind of policies and political context that will allow human beings to flourish and that like it should have, and then you're appealing to the best in the red states and the best in the blue states and you know you're and then you're differentiating it from and criticizing the worst in both sides and i think that's like that is really what we should be focused on and there's too much right now that is just really you have to pick a team and it's your team right or wrong and I think both teams are wrong about most things. So that makes it a little bit easier for me to rise above it. But even the people who are enmeshed in it, are I think there's a sense of, yeah, we really are stuck in this kind of tribal back and forth and that's not good. And then what you have to do to rise above it is just you, you need to think independently about all of these crucial issues. And, and, and that comes back to like, we are trying to arm people with the ability to think independently about one subset of those issues, um, which is the the energy and environmental issues that are going to govern our lives. Kind of tying this whole conversation together, do you see any possibility for making energy cool in the public? Can we forge inroads between the Silicon Valley culture, uh, which is so revered right now, and uh, energy production and companies that are providing just as much value, just in a less visible to the naked eye sort of way. Uh, yeah. I mean, like there's no reason 
why you shouldn't be able to. I mean, the, this is just one way that uh, Alex would put it, but I think it's really notable. So you have this whole fracking revolution um, and shale energy revolution, and the people who bring it to the world's attention are not the industry, but Josh Fox with Gasland. And the industry should have been like, this is an amazing story. And the example Alex would use is like, what if I could tell you that I could take this little piece of rock? I'm actually pointing right now to my own piece of shale that's on my desk um, and use it to power your iPhone. Mm -hmm. Like you make real the human benefits of this transformative technology. And that is something that can be exciting, but it has to be humanized and personalized and, uh, and, and the industry almost never does that. It never tells the story in a human, in a pro-human way. And so there's not that kind of excitement. But I think, you know, you you could do the same thing. I, and it's not inherent that uh, Silicon Valley could do that. So, for instance, if you think about computers, part of what made Steve Jobs so well known with Apple and so admired as a communicator was that, you know, used to have these presentations where it's this computer has 10 megabytes of the, this is back in the eighties where that was really the big announcement. Um, you know, that, and it has, you know, this many Rams and da, 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 these technical things that nobody could really relate to and weren't that meaningful. And then you had Steve jobs who really boiled it down to things like a thousand songs in your pocket. Right. And it's, Oh, I get that. Like, that's exciting. It's related to me as an individual user and, it empowers me and it's, you know, it, it's connected to my values and energy precisely because it's so vitally important to our lives. You can tell that story. And then there's just a question of, well, how do you tell the story? And that's one of the things that that we focus on. And in, in when we teach communication is how do you tell the story in a way that is inspiring because it deserves to be inspiring. And and I think just looking at our success record a lot of our fans are people who have no connection to the energy industry. Like, but they'll be wearing their I Love Fossil Fuel t-shirts because Alex's work has connected it to their lives and they can see the connection of energy to everything in their lives. Whether it's, you know, their ability to fly to see their friend's wedding or their ability to be able to, you know, just drive each day somewhere far off to take like dancing lessons that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. All of these ways in which our lives are enhanced by energy, if you actually help people see that connection, it is inspiring because it's connected to their values. I think those are all great points. Energy is an input into every single thing that we do, obviously, so it's vitally important. I, I, I think what you just said there was really interesting because it occurred to me that the arguments that you're making here kind of sound like maybe the next innovation that needs to happen in the energy industry is actually the way that the industry talks about what it does. Well, it's funny you say that because, I mean, we actually think about uh, philosophy or about the frameworks that should govern our thinking as a technology. And part of what the technology enables you to do is enables you to communicate in a much better way because when you make a framework explicit, when you give people explicit control over how they think about an issue, it's, it's extremely clarifying and empowering and so, you know, putting that technology into the hands uh, of the energy industry, I think, will empower them in, in, a, in a really massive way and already has to a certain extent. I mean, if you look at the industry's communications um, before Alex started, I mean, the, the major oil companies didn't have pictures of oil on their Web pages. It was like pictures of solar panels and, you know, wind farms, which made up, you know, 0.1 percent of their actual portfolios. I think it's gotten better in part um, because of the influence of uh, his book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, and I think it can get way better in the future. I want to circle back to something that you mentioned earlier and uh, possibly challenge you a little bit on it. Um, when you brought up climate and the possibility of uh, human beings dealing with climate change or the possibility that climate change could be um, catastrophic, I believe you said something to the effect of we want to put as many people as possible in a position to live good lives. You said something to that effect. Do you recall 
that uh, that portion of the conversation? Well, what I, what I was really getting is that we want the most human flourishing possible, and you want to create okay. the conditions where the most people are able to flourish as possible. Got it. That that comports with my recollection. So my challenge then is, does that not give a lot of credence to the utilitarian perspective on ethics? Well, utilitarianism is basically the idea that, I mean, there's different ways of formulating it, um, but it's basically that we're going to take some value, whether it's pleasure or happiness, or, you know, sometimes even just, it can be financial. And then what we're going to do is just select the policies that we think on the whole are going to lead to, um, you know, more benefits than costs. And that's not exactly how we think of it. So it's that human flourishing is this broad umbrella term that's capturing, you know, the best possible life to an individual. And then there's a question of when individuals live together, what are the policies that enable the most flourishing? And we think that the pol the basic policy that enables the most flourishing is freedom. And part of the reason is that flourishing is really something like you can't give it to somebody like Jordan. You know, you could give me a hundred dollars and you know, go ahead and do it the next time we see each other. Um, but you can't make me flourish. Flourishing is, it's an activity that we as an individual do. You and, and anybody who's had somebody who's messing up their lives that they've known, like you get, oh, I can't save them. Like I can't help them see the truth. I can't help them make better decisions. I can't improve their lives. It's something that only an individual could do. And so there can't be a policy that's going to like enforce flourishing on people, um, what you can do is you can give them the freedom so that they can take the actions that enable them to flourish if they choose. And if they choose not to, then what freedom means is that they can't stop other people from making those choices. And and so I, I don't think it it's not utilitarian in the sense of we're not saying like we're going to dictate what we think will help you flourish. It's that what we want are the policies that enable this this positive goal to be realized to the greatest extent possible. Setting aside climate change for a moment, because I don't think it should fall strictly under the pollution framework, when dealing with actual toxic pollutants from uh, that result from the combustion of fuels or from, from production, uh, how do you evaluate that and also keep in mind the widespread flourishing that you want to encourage. What what are your principles for dealing with those sorts of conflicts? Well, I mean, so, you know, at the highest level, if you think like freedom is a value, it means that you're free to pursue your life and well-being uh, independently. You don't have to get permission from people and that nobody can stop you. So nobody can point a gun to your head and take your money or take your property and if you think what pollution is, it's, it's endangering somebody through some sort of physical mechanism. And so in some cases, it can be a violation of their property rights, like you dump uh, toxic waste on their land. Um, other times it can be sort of like the health risks that are involved in a whole bunch of people in a given area engaging in an activity that when it rises above a certain threshold can have damaging health consequences. And so what you need is you need the government to define like, all right, well, what are the thresholds that will enable us to engage in the life enhancing activities of producing, say, the energy that we need, but that will protect us against the health risks. And that is going to be, it's going to depend on the context. Like if you're in a very poor primitive state of development, for instance, like if you think about the first man who created fire, like you couldn't say, oh, you're creating emissions that's hurting, you know, grok over there. Um, so you can't do that. It's no, we need to do that because like we are, we wouldn't be able to live without fire, but then you reach a certain level of, adv of advancement and you're able to engage in the productive process, um, while protecting people against those sorts of controls. So for instance, I think it's right that, you know, once you reach a certain level of economic development, then you can be concerned. All right. You know, w we have energy from coal. Can we do it in a way that is less impactful on health by certain technologies for cleaning it? And all right, so the government needs to establish a threshold. And then there's complicated questions like, well, what should the threshold be and under what circumstances? But the basic framework is that you're trying to protect people's ability to flourish, which means which includes their ability to create the energy that's 
fundamental to our flourishing and then protect people from endangerment so that that they're not having a negative health impact on each other. I like the fire example. I want to drill down on that a little bit closer. So let's say we've got Erg, who is the first person to, to ever figure out how to create fire. And then we've got Grok, who is, you know, living next to Erg. And that smoke from Erg's fire may not be benefiting his neighbor in any way. Uh, why isn't it appropriate for, let's just assume we have some sort of uh, tribal government that, um, you know, at least manages these sorts of disputes. Why wouldn't it be appropriate for the government to say to the first fire burner, we're not stopping you from doing this. We recognize you have that right. But in this geographic area, which borders upon a neighbor who is suffering because of that smoke, you can't do it, or at least set up some sort of dispute mechanism, which would enable that activity to continue, but in a way that is that comports with the well-being of the various parties that are affected by it. Yeah, so there's two different issues that are, I think, involved here. So one is the question of um, when you have activities that on in any individual case are not particularly harmful, like, you know, one car driving is not particularly harmful, but it's when in aggregate you have these harms that are kind of more widespread, then you need a situation where the government's defining certain certain standards that um, that that limit that so that you can have the most health possible. But then there's the sort of kind of one on one, your neighbors doing something that is specifically uh, you have identifiable parties where one is seeming to impinge on the other. And that that is the kind of thing that you have a court system to resolve in exactly the sort of way you're you're explaining. And and so the the wider principle, the point that I was just making with fire was um, that you can't have standards or policies that are claimed to protect health, but stop the fundamental activities that human beings need to be able to do to live, which is produce, including produce energy. So part of that calculation that seems like would be if the, the fire is being used in the production of something that is making other people's lives better, that needs to be taken into the calculation of, of the discussion, right? Well, I mean, I think just in general, like common law is pretty good on these issues. Like, you know, the, there's there's different uh, policies and laws regarding like where I can, you know, burn leaves on my property. And if I live, you know, in an area where my neighbors are clustered all around me, it's probably something I can't do versus if I live in rural Michigan, it's something where, uh, you know, it's perfectly fine. So I think exactly what these guidelines should be, you know, is very context dependent. Um, the issue is just being clear on, on what's the, what's the framework we should use to think about it. Uh, for John's benefit and for listeners benefit. Um, I wrote an article in September that deals a little bit with these issues and, and tries to untangle them vis-a-vis -vis the climate change discussion. I think it came out, uh, the last week of September, the title of it was, I think, toward a Kosian approach to climate change or something to that effect. So if you get a chance, Don, I'd love to get your feedback at some point on that piece and see if you think I'm along the right lines or if I'm going off the rail somewhere. Yeah, I'd love to to read it. I mean, the, the, the one thing I'll say in this issue is that, you know, there's there's kind of two fundamental questions on in terms of policy, right? The, one is, is there a real problem in need of a solution? And then two is, if there is a problem, what is the solution? And and I think uh, it's important to have, a, you know, for people who are thinking about these issues, you have a view on both. Um, and so that even if you don't think that there's a problem that requires a solution today, you know, you should have some concept of the solution. And if you do have a solution, you should be able to prove that there's a real problem that you're solving. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I don't think either of those happens consistently. I think most of the people advocating really restrictive climate policies, like they have not made a convincing case that there is a threat justifying those. And I think many of the people who have said like, look, the evidence is not strong enough that we should be restricting people's energy in the name of, you know, fighting this problem that you claim is existing. I don't think they have done a good enough job 
of articulating policies that they really that really they would support and that would help us address that problem if it existed. And so I think it's it's important to do both. And, um, you know, that's something that we're very interested in 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 our work at CIP. Wonderful. Uh, Don, as we near the conclusion of this discussion, is there anything that you want to bring up um, in your work or from from outside your work that you think would be interesting for our listeners to hear about? Well, so this is something that uh, Alex Epstein is doing right now that isn't uh, under the rubric of the Center for Industrial Progress, but I think is just really exciting uh, and not completely unrelated. And that's uh, something called the Human Flourishing Project, which is currently it's a podcast. But the basic idea is that he's trying to help people develop the the knowledge systems to acquire and communicate knowledge about how to flourish, not just in energy and environment, but in all sorts of areas. So for example, the last two episodes have been about nutrition and it's, well, how do we get reliable knowledge about how to flourish in the realm of nutrition? And I think in the future, we'll cover lots of topics like psychology. Um, And I think it's just, it's, it's taking this human flourishing framework that has been developed really well for us in the realm of energy, but showing how it can help us in our personal lives and then in all sorts of different policy debates. And I mean, I think long term, it's going to be some of the most valuable work he does. But just speaking as a fan, because I don't have that much to do with it directly, um, it's it's some of the most exciting stuff that that I've heard. So if anybody wants to check that out, they can go to humanflourishingproject.com or it's the Human Flourishing Project on iTunes. That's an interesting idea, uh, and it's and it's obviously necessary for for any of us who are non experts, which we all are in some realm. Um, the question arises of how do you evaluate information and how do you come to the appropriate conclusions to help guide you? Um, what are your if you had to tell somebody how to approach that in sixty seconds? What would you say, Don? Well, I mean, the the short answer is, you know, listen to the podcast. But uh, I think one thing that can be really helpful is um, the, well, how, how do you assess different experts? And this is just sort of one thing that, that I think is really uh, helpful is how do the experts deal with the opposition? That is, do they caricature it? Or do they give its strongest arguments in the most kind of clear, clarifying form they can and then explain how their view differs and why their view is superior? And so like you might not be able to tell like the, you know, the technical details of a view, but you can definitely see like this person is really explaining something clearly and they're really they're really connecting their view to the other side's case that I've heard and have questions about. And and you can you can get a long way just by really having a sharp antenna or a sensitive antenna for how uh, for evaluating experts and whereas i think what happens is most people tend to choose experts more on yeah i like their conclusion and that i mean that's basically a recipe for reaching the wrong conclusion that's don watkins of the center for industrial progress thanks for coming out today don yeah my pleasure